The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. Welcome to the California Nevada chat here on Friday, November 6th. My name is Len Dumas, Executive Director of the Northern California Section. Our apologies for a couple minutes of our delay here. We're working through a couple of issues. Uh, interestingly enough, here we are November 6th and yet a week before the Masters. So we certainly are looking forward to uh, enjoying the Masters next week. Uh, much in the news uh, this week, that hasn't stopped for a few months now as we await, we await the results of our national presidential election. And uh, we'll shortly discuss California propositions, particularly 15 and 22. Uh, at this point, it appears that uh, 15 is not quite settled, and uh, our dear friend Craig Kessler will help us with that. There were five ballots uh, in Nevada, in the state of Nevada, none which is, have affected our golf industry, so we feel pretty safe there. Uh, we do have elections going on locally. The Northern California PGA Board of Directors election is underway. Uh, the Southern California Board of the Southern California PGA Board of Directors election is also under, underway. And of course, we are grateful uh, and excited to have our PGA of America 42nd president, uh, Jim Richardson, with us today, uh, as well as Craig Kessler and, and Kevin Fitzgerald. So uh, before we get started, uh, the team, of course, Presidents Moriarty and Latendre, and Southern California PGA Executive Director, CEO Tom Annis. Uh, Chief Operating Officer Nikki Gatch and uh, the production team, Caitlin Doyle, Bryce Sieber, and Tyler Miller. Uh, so let's start with uh, some opening remarks. President Moriarty uh, is not able to make it quite yet. So I'm going to uh, turn it to our Southern California Executive Director to introduce President Latendre. Tom? Yeah, thanks, Lenny. Good morning, everybody. Uh, nice to be here. And as soon as we get the technical issues solved with uh, President Richardson. We'll uh, welcome him to the group. Uh, again, appreciate everybody being here today. Uh, another Friday as we head into, uh, as we head into November, finishing the national election, which has been uh, fairly interesting and, and talk about the state of Nevada and, uh, and uh, could be the key to the election, as a matter of fact. And so that's quite interesting. I uh, would like to also congratulate uh, Don Ray uh, and his successful election as Secretary of the PGA of America. Don is from the Southwest section, Arizona, and uh, and uh, we're very proud of Don's accomplishment and what he did, and uh, and congratulate him as well uh, as um, as the other two officers, particularly Jim uh, and John Lindert, for taking the Vice President Chair. So. Uh, next week, as Len said, is the Masters. We also, uh, I'm watching the maps, not the political maps, but the, excuse me, not the presidential maps, but the COVID maps, and there's been quite a surge, so uh, we need to be aware of what's going on outside our doors and uh, pay particular attention to, uh, you know, we talk about it every time, the safety aspect of what we're doing out there and, and helping each other uh, keep ourselves uh, uh, well, and, and I, I wish that on everyone. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce um, uh, our Southern California PGA president uh, from the Dove Canyon Golf Club, Mr. Tony Latendre. Hi, Tom. Hi, Tom. Thanks, and good morning, everybody. And uh, Len, I think the introduction list keeps getting longer and longer, so uh, uh, well done there. You, you managed to get everybody. So uh, I won't bore everybody with that and say thanks to everybody that's on the call, but I would like to at least congratulate again President Richardson on uh, being sworn in. I was lucky enough to, to uh, visit our neighboring section uh, during the annual meeting. You know, we obviously socially distanced and, and did all of the right things, but it was nice to represent our section uh, and to show our uh, appreciation for his service and, and be there when he was sworn in as president and uh, be one of the first to congratulate him. So, Jim, again, congratulations and thanks for being with us today. We certainly appreciate it. And uh, Craig, looking forward to hear hearing what's, uh, what's going on or what the buzz is about Props 15 and 22. Um, hopefully maybe some good news for us and, and, some, and lead off of those. So uh, uh, let's see what happens. But again, thanks for letting me be with you this morning and thanks for everybody for joining us and we'll look forward to seeing what everybody has to say. 
Thanks, Tony. Uh, we also have Scott Wellington with us. Scott is the Senior Director for the Section of Business Operations. He's listening in. And Ken Farrell, our uh, PJ of America Employment Consultant. And uh, we welcome uh, everyone. So Len, take it away. And Jim is uh, on the line uh, without a camera. So let's go for it. All right, thank you, Tom. And uh, uh, President Richardson, welcome and, and congratulations, Jim, on your election as the 42nd president of, of the PJ of America. Uh, you have strong ties, certainly strong, strong ties to District 11, having been uh, both here in Northern California and in the Aloha section. Uh, Jim, we can't thank you for your time today. I, I know that as busy as your calendar was as vice president, it, it's probably uh, gone through the roof and uh, even more so now. So uh, thank you for being with us today. And uh, here we are a week away from the master. So Jim, uh, to start with, you know, your observations on 2020 and uh, like uh, we made it <laughs> and then uh, 2021 and looking forward. So again, Jim, thank you for being here and being back in California with us to some extent. Yeah, good morning, Len and Tom. Thank you for uh, having me on and inviting me. I apologize for my camera and technical difficulties, but it's great to join you all. And as you said, I spent uh, five and a half years in the NorCal section and three and a half years in the Aloha section. So a lot of great uh, friendships and memories there. As you said, 2020, uh, you know, really not over yet. Um, I think a lot of people are looking to get it behind us for many reasons, but I know you all have led the charge in a lot of respects on uh, opening facilities and working with governmental officials and health officials. So can't thank you all enough in California and Nevada who were part of that. Uh, we have staff at a national level that continue to work on that. Uh, as we see around the country, some either towns or counties or states now having to take some steps backwards. Um, and, and it'll be something that we'll need to concentrate on, obviously, moving forward into 2021. But one of the things that's really um, impressed upon me is, I think, our uh, ability and communication from a national level uh, to support sections uh, as it relates to government regulations and working with our government officials. We've done different things over the years on Capitol Hill and obviously different sections like the two of you. Uh, have kind of led the charge, but uh, I've had a couple conversations with a few other people, and and uh, it's going to be uh, more of a priority, at least um, during my presidency. Because I think with not only what we've dealt with out on the west, uh, with COVID, with fires, with all the water restrictions, you look around the country, and they, every every area geographically deals with different issues that directly relate to government officials and things that they're voting on or not voting on that really affect golf courses and those that work in the golf industry. So uh, yeah, I believe it needs to be more of a priority moving forward. Uh, I hope to accomplish that in the next two years and hopefully set that as something that uh, we'll be doing moving forward. Uh, but thank you both for lead, leading that charge because I know you probably deal with uh, more than just about any state, a lot of the different regulations and everything that you've done and the work that you've done this past year not only in that regard, but related to COVID, uh, you know, congratulations and thank you for leading the charge. But I'm here to try to help assist uh, in any way that I can. Look forward to joining the rest of the call. And again, thanks for having me on today. Yeah, Jim, thank you. And, you know, uh, there was no question much good that came out of this as well. And, and uh, you know, from our chair, certainly the alliance in putting the back to golf protocols together and working with the CDC as directly as we can. And do you see, Jim, do you see everyone staying as close as we became in 2020? Uh, certainly with the tour, that relationship has been longstanding. Uh, but with the golf course owners and the GCSAA and so on and so forth, we're closer than we've ever been. And Jim, would you expect us to stay that way? Yeah, I mean, out of, out of every kind of great, you know, tragedy, you know, come some positives. And you said, Lynn, you really forced, I think, all the allied associations to work together more closely and, and for the same common goal. And it's no secret over our, you know, the history of our industry, we've had times where everybody's been splintered and, and working on their own thing. And a lot of times, several organizations actually working on the same uh, either program or same initiative, but doing it in their own way. And you're right, we are very close in that regard because of COVID. Uh, and the goal is to try to keep it that way. 
Um, and I'm sure that there's going to be some times where one of the organizations or another kind of gets uh, on their own track. But uh, that is going to be something we'll obviously continue to work on. We do have very good relationships now. Uh, I don't think the COVID situation coming out of it for a lot of industries is going to change going into 21. We're obviously still going to be dealing with it in a lot of different ways. Um, so hopefully that continues to strengthen those relationships and something that, that we'll continue to move forward with in 2021 and beyond. Uh, Jim, Jim, that's a really important point. We know uh, at this point that the merchandise show is going to go virtual uh, it, we're planning, mo many sections are planning, if not all, planning for 2021. Jim, are you running a plan A and is HQ running, uh, you know, we know, let's say Q1 and Q2 is probably going to be virtual, but maybe there's another piece of paper that's got the possibility of being together uh, for Q3 and Q4. Are we thinking that way? I hope, I hope. <laughs> yeah, no question, Lynn, and much like everybody right now, right, we're, we're going through the budget process for our golf courses that I'm involved with. I know a lot of others are doing their budgets right for 2021 calendar year and PGA at a national perspective is really no different. Obviously our calendar year is different than our financial year. So we run through March, which we put a lot of contingency plans in and cutbacks and things of that nature uh, for this fiscal year. But we're looking ahead, as you said, to 21. And obviously we have to keep that in mind. Uh, the focus is how do we make sure that we continue to offer the support to sections and members around the country with programs that we're already involved with? Um, and a lot of them, because of COVID, are exploding, right? PJ Junior League is, yeah, had a fantastic year even based on COVID with over 37,000 kids participating, even with all the restrictions and courses being closed at different times during the year. The PJ Hope and a lot of uh, our sections that are running it you know, have reached out to say, we want to hold another session and we have our hope participants that are really reaching out that they love to stay more connected and have another you know program to be involved with and to, as opposed to waiting until next year we have to find ways as best we can to try to help in that regard and funding's tough for everybody it's it's tough at the national level um, our championships really are what fuel a lot of our financial resources and this year in 2020, having you know the PGA Championship and the KPMG Women's take place with no spectators and no corporate hospitality, that affected some things. And pushing the Ryder Cup out from 20 to 21, you know, really affected things as well too. Again, we think they were, they were all in the best interest of our stakeholders, of our members, and of safety of the players. Uh, but it does affect the bottom line. So we've got to really make sure we're taking a really good look. Uh, and to a certain degree, you know, kind of almost starting over in some ways, because what we don't want to happen is lessen the support that we give to members and lessen the support that we give to sections. Uh, so hopefully we can continue to make smart decisions and do that in a way to actually increase the support to sections and, and to members, but at the same time being fiscally responsible. So the reality is it, it's going to be a little tougher this next, you know, 12 to 18 months because of some of those things that happened during COVID. Uh, but we're in a lot of discussions as a board level, as a new officer corps, and with uh, Seth Wa, our CEO, and senior staff on making sure that whatever we do is not lessening any type of services that we're offering to sections and the members. And, and hopefully as we work our way out of this, we'll be able to offer more and more support and services as we get into 2021. Jim, thank you for that. And it has been tremendous, the communication. You know, Scott, as Tom mentioned, Scott Wellington, Senior Director of Section Business Operations is on today. And Scott, for you and the team, uh, thanks so much for everything in, in keeping us informed and being our liaison and connect uh, to HQ. And Jim as well, all the concessions, even moving the dues deadline out to October 31 was a tremendous help to so many of our members and associates uh, as the year was rocky and unpredictable totally. So Jim, you know, as you mentioned, the the Initiatives are strong. Uh, you know, here in California, we're blessed that we can keep going uh, in terms of a 12 month season. Uh, we still have a lot of events to come, a lot of uh, PJ Hope, as you mentioned, a couple of graduations this week, a couple more graduations next week. And, and uh, actually, we're doing two, two veteran drive, chip, and putts this coming Monday and Tuesday, and the, in a in celebration of, of Veterans Day. So, Jim, as we look at the calendar from our, our professional and our championships, 
here we are a week from the Masters, but the next Masters is right around the corner, followed by, we hope, the PGA at Kiowa and in May, and then, of course, June, uh, the U.S. Open, then the Open, and then right to the Ryder Cup uh, back at Whistling Straits. So we certainly could have planned that one, and it would seem to be a cause for optimism. Yeah, well, I have no question. I mean, if you're a golf fan, right, you get a lot of you know, major action uh, in a shorter period of time with the way that the schedule lined up. But, uh, you know, th those are great events, especially our own, you know, events that are televised with the PGA, the KPMG seniors, and the KPMG women's, and then the Ryder Cup. And not only are they great golf events, but they're great ways to really promote, you know, the PGA of America and our members. And we've done a good job with that in the past, and, and hopefully we can even up those efforts. Uh, not only on the local and regional level, but a lot of what we're doing around the country, uh, really letting people know about some of those programs of Junior League Golf, Drive, Chip, and Putt, of PJ Hope, and the programs that we have going on with PJ Works in the you know, inclusion and diversity space. We need to keep trumpeting that as much as we can. And those golf events are good ways to do it, because although a lot of golf fans know about some of those programs, you know, there's a lot of casual sports fans that watch those televised events, and they may not be aware of the programs. And we're also discussing you know, how do we get out to non-traditional golf venues using our media partners. So we reach a new you know, potential customer base, and we need to reach parents that may not be involved in golf at all. And when they hear about some of the programs and some of the virtues and some of the things that we're doing as an organization, that they may want to get involved or they want to get their sons or daughter involved, or they know a military veteran, you know, or they know someone it's got kids that are active in sports and looking for an activity. So we got to find ways to, to get out to more people in a, in a larger base. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully we'll continue to, to look at ways to do that and utilize our media partners in that regard so we can really kind of grow the net and bring more people into the game. Jim, with the ongoing conversations, I'm sure, with, with the CDC uh, and such, I think I think it's safe to say we do anticipate many of the protocols uh, that we have in place now in terms of our behaviors at at facilities, for instance, uh, flag sticks staying in the holes and single car riders, even though we've kind of moved here in California to a large extent to two in a car as long as there's a divider. But but I think let's be honest, we expect some of these to say uh, to stay and, and Jim to take that out a little further. Uh, as we get deeper into the year, fingers crossed type of thing, you know, to the to the PGA Championship, even to the U.S. Open and and uh, perhaps even the Ryder Cup, that maybe there there's a possibility of having a fan base there. Is that is that are those conversations yeah. going on? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and as you said, Len, I think some of these protocols and safety measures may continue. I mean, I'm dating myself a bit, but I, I remember when you didn't have to wear a seatbelt when you drove a car. You know, and there are safety protocols that change um, things all the time. Um, I'm back to traveling a little bit and a little bit on the road, not anywhere near what I used to, but you know, those safety protocols are probably going to continue, you know, if you're flying as far as checking in and temperature checks and wearing masks and things of that nature. And, you know, I, like most people, are happy to do it in order to get back to a little bit more of normalcy and, and do things that you need to do. Um, but we're hopeful, no question, as you said. Um, we're seeing now on the on the PGA Tour that they are allowing a few thousand people in each event. I've talked to some counterparts here in the Scottsdale market for the upcoming, you know, Phoenix Open. The Waste Management is one of the biggest sporting events here in the state. And, uh, you know, internally they're talking about allowing a certain percentage of spectators in, uh, not anywhere close to what they normally would. But so we're seeing some of that ease and we're seeing other sporting events starting to allow a certain percentage of fans as well. And, Hopefully those protocols can help, you know, in a safe manner, uh, people to return to some of those events. And we're very hopeful in golf as well, too. The kickoff for ticket sales at Kiwa went fantastic. Now, Roger Warren, one of our past presidents, is the president of that entire resort. And he and his team, you know, are, are slated to have a fantastic PGA Championship. And they had a, a kind of a record ticket sales as they kicked off. They sold out in a matter of days. So if, if we're allowed to, and the health officials allow us to, and protocols allow us to, you know, we're going to have a, a very well-attended PGA Championship at Kiwa. And if not, there's some you know, contingency plans in place to allow you know, a certain percentage if that's what we have to go to. But you're right. We have to, have to do it in a very responsible manner. 
I think we owe it to all of our PGA members, all of our stakeholders and potential customers uh, to make sure that we're doing it in a very responsible manner. So we want to keep courses open uh, and then hopefully some of our major championships and televised events and other things that tie into that, you know, start to ease back in and get back to normal as well. So I think it's a good sign to see that the PGA Tour is being able to move in that direction through their conversations with the uh, statewide and you know local officials in those areas where they're hosting events and that health officials are agreeing that uh, they it can be done in a responsible manner so we hope that continues to get back each and every month a little bit better and and hopefully we're a little closer to normal by the time we get to may and the pj championship at the ocean course at kiwa yeah hey, Jim, Jim, that's all good news were, were we um PJ of America, you know, is reading that uh, Prime Minister Johnson is locking down, you know, getting ready to, to lock down England at the moment and unfortunately included all the golf courses in there. Uh, were we able to advocate a little bit? Uh, granted, the decision has been made, but were, were we part of that conversation? No. Well, we weren't directly with their government, right? But we were with our counterparts in GBNI. Uh, and some input with others that are involved in that. So I, I was actually just in uh, a call with Alan White, who's the chairman of PGA GBNI, just uh, last week, you know, and talking about this. So, and obviously we've shared information on what we're doing. We've shared information what all of our allied associations did with Back to Golf and our ongoing conversations. So absolutely, we lent support there, but we really weren't part of the direct conversation, you know, with uh, the UK government officials. And that was handled a little bit more on the local level, but, but absolutely, there are counterparts. You know, we're all in this game together. Uh, what helps one benefits the other, and uh, we are going to lend support and continue to do that as best we can. Hey, Jim, this is Tom. Um, I've been uh, and remain on the ex extreme side or conservative side of safety, but I noticed in the tour event in Houston, uh, and it's nice to get fans back, uh, but I did notice that that most uh, of the fans were not wearing face coverings and not safe distancing. Is that done event by event, or does the tour uh, set those protocols when when fans or, or gallery is allowed into events? Yeah, Tom, it's a great question. I, I, I they have protocols and they have it in place. But I know that, uh, you know, much like we've seen on televised NFL games and other sporting events, some people are adhering to them better than others. So they have them in place and they're supposed to be uh, adhering to those. Uh, and then obviously uh, we see that that's not always taking place. I know it's a concern of Jays and the tour to make sure that, uh, you know, they don't take a step backwards. They want to make sure they're doing it by all the CDC guidelines and political and health official guidelines. So. It's something they're working on to make sure that they're, you know, really adhering and that all the fans and host facilities are adhering to it. Uh, I do believe that they probably had a couple of hiccups starting out as they, you know, went that direction by adding a few thousand fans to each event. So hopefully that's an anomaly versus something that we'll see moving forward, uh, because obviously we want to be able to try to move forward. And if we can't, you know, we're going to have to, as you said, really err on the side of safety first and making sure that it's done in a proper manner. Yeah, thanks. I think so too. Thank you. So, Jim, back to to 2020 turning into 2021. Certainly, our thanks, you know, to you as vice president and to Susie. What what an amazing year! And you know, I've said often we know what we know that's been expressed to us, but there, I'm sure, were so many, so many difficult uh, conversations and decisions along the way. And we're we're sorry that we weren't able to send Susie send Susie off in a traditional manner. But but our heartfelt thanks to everything that she did to us in her term as president. And also, you know, congratulations to John moving into the vice president chair and certainly to Don uh, moving into the secretary's chair. So have you had a chance to get with them? Uh, I'm sure you had on, on a level, Jim, to start to dig into what 2021 and forward looks like with the new officer team. Yeah, absolutely. We, we've talked daily uh, multiple times a day uh, since last Thursday. So. Um, you know, we want to make sure we're on the same page and have the same type of focus moving forward. And I, I just comment on your on your first portion of that, Lamb, and 
it, it was uh, disappointing that we weren't able to give you know President Whaley the, the right type of send off, and it would have been great to be together with the delegates from around the country and executive directors and staff. But you now I feel pretty safe in being able to talk for Susie and John Leonard and myself and the candidates that uh, you know really wasn't about the celebration of our party. Everybody is really about focused on trying to take the best steps forward. Um, you know, really for our members and continuing to work ourselves out of this kind of COVID situation uh, so that golf can remain moving forward. So we would have loved to all been together, but we know that's not the focus either. And at some point in the future, we'll all be able to get together again. But you, yes, absolutely. John and Don and I talk several times a day. Uh, we talk with Seth and senior staff daily as well, too. Um, you know, it's really, again, it's trying to continue that. Um, you know, the situation of we know we're dealing with difficult situation. We know a lot of our members have struggled over the year at different times. People have been laid off, people have lost their jobs, and people have had to deal with a lot of situations that have come with it. Along with throwing on top of that, you know, the fires out west and hurricanes in the south and, and storms and power outages in the northeast. So it's been a very challenging year. And even those facilities that have bounced back the last several months, and they've showed record rounds of golf. You know, golf professionals and staffs are asked to do more with less over the last several months, and a lot of them are burned out. So, you know, it's uh, trying to make sure we're adding support and lending support and letting them know we're here if they need us, uh, letting them know some of the resources that we have, whether it's our support, you know, system, whether they can go to pj.org and uh, get on support link if there's somebody that they need to talk to professionally or knowing that they can reach out to their section officials or national officials, because we're here for them. And that's what I think our role is, is to try to support and try to be here as much as we can. But yeah, it's uh, trying to crystal ball 2021. I mean, we're all talking about you know, how can we make sure that we are being responsible so that golf remains open, and viable. At the same point in time, how do we make sure we're engaging this new customer base that's come into the game? And those that have been, you know, distressed golfers that may have been away for it for a few years and that are back playing again, you know, how do we continue to make sure that they're welcome, that uh, we continue to reach out to them about programming, we continue to reach out and let them know that they might be playing, but, you know, we've got junior programs if their kids are interested. We have beginner programs if their spouses want to play. We've got leagues that they can get involved with and all the different aspects uh, that golf professionals are offering around the country. So. We've got a lot of work to do. We want to keep all those people involved and in the game and playing in 2021 and beyond. And we also know that our members, uh, you know, need our help and support because they've dealt with a lot this past year. So those are the things we're talking about and talking about with senior staff on how we can, you know, offer more and how we can lend more support and how we can make sure we drive home the message that golf is a great game and a great sport and it can really be done in a responsible manner right now with what everybody's dealing with. Well, Jim, I, I want to say thank you, you know, uh, and again, congratulations, congratulations. A uh, little bit selfishly, we're grateful to have you in Arizona, uh, not quite District 11, but pretty darn close. So we've got you right down the street, so to speak, and, and we're thrilled about that. And uh, Jim, for everything that was done in 2020 and, and the great things that are uh, coming up for 21 and beyond, uh, the industry is thriving. We know that. And you, you brought up something very important that there's a little burnout going on and we're tired, but we're, you know, it's, it's also, it's also some gratitude in that, that we are as busy as we are and working on plans now of, of retaining and sustaining when the soccer fields reopen and the baseball fields reopen and on and on. So it's great to see the families out there. Uh, Jim, thank you for your time. Uh, good luck. And please, of course, let us know whatever we can do to support. No, I really appreciate it, Landon. Tom, thanks for inviting me and having me on. And sorry for my te technical difficulties, but I'm glad I was able to join by phone. And I look forward to uh, being all with you uh, over the course of the next couple of years. Thanks, Thank Jim. You, Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we, we also had some local um, propositions as well that are important uh, to us as an industry and to us as facilities. And I'd like to welcome our own uh, Craig Kessler, Director of Government Affairs for the Southern California Golf Association and Kevin Fitzgerald, Assistant Director of Government Affairs, Affairs for the SCGA. And, and Craig, probably I think two of the most 
that are important to us for 22 and 15. And as we discussed earlier, it looks like 22 uh, has been victorious, but 15 is still is still in the counting stages. So Craig, it's all yours. Thank you, Len. Thank you, Tom. Thanks to both sections and thanks to President Richardson. Uh, just before I get to that, just a brief encapsulization of the um, national election, uh, which is rounding into form right now. I'm sure everyone noticed we had a national election a few days ago. It appeared that the, uh, the occupant of the White House is coming into focus, and that's on its way to probably being firmly established sometime today. With respect to the House of Representatives, instead of picking up uh, seats, uh, it would appear that the Democratic majority will be, will when all is said and done and all is counted, will have been shrunk by anywhere from five to eight seats. That's not enough to flip the uh, House to the Republicans, uh, but it certainly has been enough to uh, cause a great deal of distress for the for Speaker Pelosi. If, as far as the United States Senate, uh, the, they, uh, who, which party controls that will be determined on March 5th, excuse me, January 5th, or however long it takes to count the votes in Georgia, uh, since they're doing a recount of their presidential election, it would appear it's that close. And that's because there are two runoffs uh, for the Senate seats and um, the odds of that being a split ticket are near zero. So if the uh, Republican candidates, and one, one of whom is an incumbent, retain those seats, the Republicans will continue to control the Senate. If the Democrats take both seats, the Democrats will take control of the Senate. Also on a national level, I know the Democratic Party had expected or had planned or had hoped to flip a lot of uh, state legislatures, and they flipped a couple, but nowhere near the number that they had anticipated. And that probably had something to do uh, with the strength of the top of the Republican ticket in the form of uh, President Trump, who, uh, Outpunched his, his, at least outpunched the, the his weight as uh, given to us by by pollsters going into the uh, Tuesday election. Not enough to overcome, but uh, enough probably to have um, uh, dampened a lot of the enthusiasm of the Democratic Party, and which had more ambitions for the 2020 election than will end up coming to fruition. Here in California, as an overview, before I get to the two. Initiatives that were the, have been the focus of our attention on the election uh, would appear that the Democratic supermajority in the state assembly will be reduced by one, but it will still be a two thirds plus supermajority. And the supermajority, two thirds supermajority in the state Senate will be increased by one uh, seat, but, and of course be added to the supermajority. Now on to the initiatives. First, uh, Proposition 15, split roll. Uh, really the first effort in 42 years to, uh, to institute massive reforms to our property tax structure, uh, which would have exempted all residential properties, but would have exposed all non-residential properties to a new assessor's assessment paradigm. They would be required to be reassessed at, at current market valuation at least once every three years and have their property taxes based thereon. Currently, under, under well, and, 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 it, and I would say it would appear going into the future, uh, they're only assessed upon sale of the property. Now, the uh, California Alliance for Golf, the SCGA, all the organizations on this call, put out a very, very substantial and detailed white paper. I know it was complicated, but how you assess Proposition 15's impact upon California's various different types of golf properties is a very complicated question which would have only been partially answered by Prop 15 were it to pass. I need to point out, with 75% of the vote counted, Prop 15 is sitting at 48.3% yes, which means that unless uh, the 25% re remaining ballots are, are, are out go in a yes uh, direction that probably is somewhere in 55 to 57% in order to overcome the no vote right now, this proposition is going to fail, which makes me look like a genius because when asked, I thought it would stall out at about 47 to 49%, 48% would be right in the middle of that. If it does stall out, it will, um, it will have stalled out uh, because of its proponents uh, made a key error. They wrote some language 
uh, in the initiative that purported to protect small business because they understood that would be a vulnerability in, in any campaign against it. But it would appear that they didn't have a good understanding of how small businesses are affected by the, uh, the organ of the triple net lease, which means that they, most small businesses rent their uh, office space or their business space from huge commercial uh, landowners who are not exempt, would not be exempt under Prop 15. And those, pass, those uh, taxes are passed through as a function of those leases, which means they were able to credibly run ad, ads on television, which I'm sure you all saw, which focused on how this would damage small business and small businesses would be forced to raise their prices that we all pay. And that was a very successful campaign. I go into this kind of detail to point out that if this does indeed, as I think it will, but it may not, it still can pass. It's not, not certainly not being beyond the realm of possibility. Ability, um, that they will come back, whether they come back in two years or four years, and they will come back and they will cure that little problem uh, that kept them from getting over the top. So I think that uh, the course that we pursued, and not all of golf's organizations did, but almost all of them did, which put out all of the facts and, made, and gave, gave all of the different golf organizations in this state a very, very accurate white paper as to what the impact would be, and then members of clubs or persons in the industry could do it, you know, could do what they thought as citizens was appropriate in terms of either voting, in terms of communicating, in terms of getting those messages out, in terms of even giving to campaigns, but not doing it as golf clubs or as golf organizations in order to keep golf out of the crosshairs of a pretty ugly uh, political campaign uh, proved to be a pretty good. Um, uh, a pretty a pretty good approach to it because as I've explained, should Prop 15 pass, most of the action for the golf industry will be in the subsequent enabling legislation that's absolutely commanded by the constitutional the changes in the constitutional language, and by interpretations of a board of equalization, and more particularly by assessors in this state, and to the degree to which that we would have stuck the the property tax advantages, which are very real in this state under the California Constitution for private equity clubs, we would have put all of our private clubs in the crosshairs of what was the Pro 15 campaign, which was, I'm going to state, state it crudely, which, which is that the idle rich are not paying their fair share of taxes, and that's why we do it. And if they did, we would have better fire services and better schools and so forth. It, it, was, it was excellent uh, st strategy to keep our industry out of that. And, and to keep it out of that, out of the crosshairs of that particular fight, moving forward uh, into what's gonna be clearly come back is should this fail in 2022 or 2024, they're gonna keep coming at it. Had they stalled out at 36 or 37%, they may have gone away. Um, now that brings me to Prop 22, which was the initiative sponsored by, mostly by Uber, Lyft, Postmates, Dash, DoorDash, all of the app-based gig industries that uh, that were the target, really, of, of Assembly Bill Five in 2019. Uh, they weren't the only <laughs> they weren't the only ones caught in the net of of, of, of AB Five in 2019, as everyone on this call knows. Uh, but they were the target, and they were not given any. They even our even Governor Newsom tried to broker some compromises in that bill, and the California Labor Federation, I think, in an effort to show that they run the show in the California State Legislature, both houses um, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't give an inch and um, went forward. And whereas, for example, PGA professionals, um, youth sports coaches, and even caddies, which I had predicted we would not succeed on in any measure, uh, received a substantial measure of relief. Now the caddies and the youth coaches, coaches didn't in AB5 in 2019, but in AB 2257 in 2020, um, they received relief and the golf professionals received even better relief in the, in the business to business for professional services exception that, that brings in a whole host of um, professions and, and um, occupations in California that are not licensed and thus are not identified specifically as such in the labor code but for which a form of independent uh, contracting is, is deemed legitimate. And that's why we, and, and I think we, we had success in 2019 with the author of the bill 
and even more success in, in, in uh, 2020. I think there's one little component of that 12 prong test that we need to fix in, 20, um, in 2021, and that will probably be an item on the agenda of next Tuesday afternoon's uh, board meeting of the California Alliance for Golf as we establish a, um, some kind of a uh, opening of a, what's, what, what's our legislative agenda in 2021 beyond just COVID-19, which is not really a legislative agenda. It's a county by county, and in some places, a city within each county by county slog, long slog. But there's an overall narrative that deals with it as well, and I'm sure that will come up. So the Labor Federation spoke in Sacramento and made clear who had the votes and who was in charge. Uh, but the people of the state of California said something on Tuesday to about a 58% level, and that could go up as all the votes are counted. It could go slightly down, but it's been called because it's a sure thing. So the gig industry spent uh, $200 million in an inordinate amount, seemingly. I might add that after spending $200 million, if you take a look at what happened to their stock prices the next day and to their equity evaluations, went in, up in the billions. And that's a consistent pattern. You've probably heard that from me before, and you'll hear it from me again, and you'll hear it from others. Uh, $200 million was not a lot of money to spend to make billions. And that's generally the way in which most industries, most sectors look at advocacy, not as an expense, but an investment. Now, sometimes you spend $200 million on, on a ballot initiative, and you lose, in which case you may, have well, you may well have burned the money in the fireplace. Uh, but in this case, they did not lose. They won overwhelmingly. And I think that with respect to independent contracting, that did make it easier for us to get that one additional change we need. But I think it also made clear that the strategy that the golf industry pursued with respect to this, particularly for PGA professionals, was the right one in 2019 and again in 2020. Like I've stated, there was no, we can't afford a $200 million initiative on a California ballot. In addition, unless PGA professionals and youth sports coaches and caddies want to become licensed and regulated by the state of California. Uh, there's no way to get specific exemptions in the in the uh, in the business in the business code, which then tag back to the labor code. You need to be identified that way. Uh, you have your own certifications through a non-governmental organization, and I'm talking to two of them in the state right now: the Northern Cal PGA, along with Nevada, and the Southern California PGA section. And, and most of the PGA pros I know probably want to keep it that way, and particularly with Prop 22 being as successful it was and kind of giving an indicator that the people of the state of California think that that particular issue, independent contracting versus employment, is not a black or white or either or issue, but a very complicated one for, the, for, a, for an economy that's the fifth largest in the world, in which there are a lot of gradations in between. Uh, interestingly, along those lines, uh, reporting today is that the uh, CEO of Lyft has reached out to organized labor to suggest that they open up conversations about some form of unionization within, uh, at least with their company. Uh, labor is a little burned up at Tuesday's election and kind of snapped back, but we'll see what happens in that regard. And we'll see if whether if the fact that Governor Newsom remained neutral on that proposition, he didn't on 15. Uh, but he did on 22, maybe puts him in a position to be a broker of that particular sensitive issue. But I would say that uh, it was probably on, on Prop 22 good news. Final comment, and it's uh, not about the election, but it's about uh, some words I heard from President Richardson at the beginning, which uh, about uh, what, what struck me as an increased focus moving forward in the next couple of years on the central role of advocacy. I think that's something that's been brewing uh, within the PGA for a while. I think if nothing else, COVID-19 at that level, not just with the PGA, but with the United States Golf Association, and its new strategic plan has four separate pillars. And in one of them, advocacy is mentioned and more community orientation is mentioned. I'm not sure that the USGA knows exactly what it wants to do with that yet, but they seem committed to moving in that direction. And that's something that's brand new. So with the PGA moving in that direction, with the USGA moving in that direction, the GCSA long ago headed down that road and is well, along, is well down that road. I think that's really encouraging that for those of us in California. As I listened to some of the comments about how maybe COVID-19, uh, because it was a crisis, 
cause the golf organizations to stop operating in in uh, con in contradiction with each other or apart from each other, and in some cases, some of the organizations working in direct competition, and realize that old Ben uh, Franklin, ad you know, adage at, at the dawn of the American Revolution, that gentlemen, I suggest we hang together, or surely we will hang separately. That's a lesson we learned here in California a long time ago. It wasn't on a pandemic, uh, but it was more had it had more to do with uh, challenges in water issues, drought issues, from time to time tax issues to a somewhat lesser extent. And I think that put us in very good position to take that, that record and that culture of, of cooperation and put us in great stead in, in dealing uh, with COVID-19. Uh, and we had a tougher road to hoe than, my, than our colleagues in other states because other states had the luxury of dealing with one entity, a governor's office or one, one office of state public health. And we had to deal with um, 58 separate counties. And now in Southern California, there's only 10 counties, but one of those counties has 10 million, has in excess of 10 million persons. So it's a tough one to deal with. It's bigger than most states in this country. And that's Los Angeles County. But I think we, we handle ourselves fairly well. Everyone knows, yeah, we had an election on Tuesday and that's consumed everyone's attention. But what may have not consumed your attention this week is that cases are spiking up. Very serious spikes in many parts of the United States. Obviously hearing on this, in this call that there's a, maybe an effort to lock down the United Kingdom. Uh, but here in California, our numbers are up. They're not up badly, but, but they're up. And for those of us who live in Los Angeles County had hoped that we could move out of a tier and get some relaxations, that's going to be a long time coming. And uh, with flu season on its way here, we're getting a little bit into the unknown. However, the numbers are nowhere near where the numbers were at the dawn of the pandemic. And remember, the shutdowns here, which included golf for a couple of, for a handful of weeks in some places, there were other places in the state, like Sacramento, where our capital is, county, or San Luis Obispo County, where golf remained open throughout. The good news is that despite having the longest record of an outdoor recreational activity that's been up and running, golf has not been singled out, has not been identified as a source of infection, a hot spot, either on the employment side or on the customer side. And for the most part, uh, golf courses have been pretty good at maintaining all the rules and have not gotten themselves on the front page of a paper like some industries have or on the eyewitness news. I, I would just implore everyone, I'm probably in that Tom Addis camp and we come across as you know, hectoring school moms maybe, that it is important as those numbers go up and there may be some rollbacks on certain businesses and there may be some freezes on things that we had hoped would come back into our lives. We wanna make sure that that 26% increase, at least in the greens fee side or, or the you know, membership fee size or the play side of our business, I think we can maintain that. And that ball is very much in our hands. We've put on a good show. We have a good reputation with the public health agencies that make these decisions. And it's really, and I know as we've become sort of lax, you become, you know, you become a little bit inured uh, to this after a while and everyone discusses in terms of fatigue. And I know we're all fatigued, but uh, stay vigilant on that. And if we do, I think um, we, will, we will make it through perhaps a, a flu uh, season, uh, a spike, a little bit of a, of a second wave, a, a legitimate second wave, not a second or third wave, but the first wave and get through it here in the state of California. Uh, but again, in, in the golf industry, that ball is in our court. So let's not get lax and let's uh, recognize that uh, with so many businesses, uh, I think President Richardson had said that, you know, the next 18 months are in which some reality is gonna set in. And there's some certain things about this, which are just going to be tough. For most other industries and activities, it's a lot tougher than we have it. And I think we should parlay that gratitude into vigilance and if we do that we can continue to remain grateful and keep our heads above water. Len, I don't know whether I answered all your questions on 15 or 22 or whether I went into too much detail on those questions and confused everyone, but uh, that pretty much ends it today for uh, my monologue on the subject. 
And Craig, that was that was great. Thank you again. The, there, there's a lot at stake. There has been all year. And even though it's winding down to some extent, as you express, we still need to maintain our vigilance and our, our, our protocols to keep having the success that we're having. Uh, one, one thought on 15, Craig, to tie in something that came up a few years ago, uh, should 15 fail, and as you mentioned, they might come back in two years, might come back in four years. And the, the reference I'd made a couple of years ago, I remember there was a, it was floated out there to start mem to tax members dues at clubs to tax golf lessons and such. Uh, do you think as, as the state regroups and certainly took a tremendous financial hit this year, that, that those things might come back? There's always a possibility of adding on another page to a bill or adding on another page to amendment for another revenue grab, if you will. Always a possibility? COVID-19 has devastated the budgets of every municipal government in the state of California. And they have to balance their budgets. They can't print money like the federal government can. So there's always, there's gonna be a constant search for revenue dollars, and that means taxes, that means fees. But let me point something out. It turned out that something as seemingly simple as changing the property tax paradigm in the state so that industrial or non-residential properties would simply be reassessed at least once every three years and have their property taxes based thereon, produced a white paper from the California Assessors Association asking for hundreds of millions of dollars and staffing and pointed out all kinds of complications with just effectuating that. If you think about that for a moment, you think about that experience, a service tax, which is what you're talking about, which about 22 states in the country have, uh, would, would pose infinitely more complications and, would, and would, not, would present something quite a bit different from the very simple nature as sort of making sure, I mean, the, the campaign for 15 could be boiled down to the idle rich fat cats who haven't been paying their fair share, we're gonna get the fair share of taxes from them and, and fund things. That didn't work. And that didn't work in part because the very persons who would be charged at the, at the county level, the assessors, with enforcing this indicated they didn't, they didn't really understand it. It was so complicated. They, they didn't think they could pull it off. So a service tax is always problematic in that particular sense. And a direct tax on golf, which by the way, a number of states have, we've, ne we've always not had it in California. I think the important thing to recognize is that, and I think that was one of the things that I've tried to do, and it probably irritated some people that I've done it as much as I have, is to mention that California's constitution has a provision in it put there by the voters in 1960 that creates very that creates very benign basis upon which at least the golf course proper property of, of a private equity golf club is taxed. Most states don't have that. It's one of the reasons that we don't have sometimes the tension between a municipal sector, which is exempt, and a daily fee sector, which yes, pays the taxes, but the assessors have simply treated daily fee courses from what near as I can tell in most places in this state as if they were private clubs, considered them open space. And that open space, if it's in San Francisco or downtown or, or anywhere in Los Angeles, is an open space that if it could be zoned differently and it could get different entitlements, we would billions and billions of dollars. And anything worth an assessed billions and billions of dollars pays taxes based on that assessment. And so um, again, there are a number of things that it, it's often, I, I've often said that it isn't just what you do in the public arena. Your theory of your case isn't just the, the arguments that you make, but oftentimes be careful that some of the arguments you make because you deal with them in an echo chamber invite counter arguments that, that puts your blood in the water. In this case, it'd be a tax benefits, you know, assessment benefits, in a way that could create a firestorm of populist politics and in your question, and I'm giving a long answer, Len, because your, your question is based upon the understanding that governments are really out there looking for money and the degree to which we uh, get exposed in the media as a fat cat. We know a lot of the sectors in this industry don't fit that, but that's not always the reputation. 
um, is something we have to be constantly alert about. And with all of our strategies and all of our positioning has to be done with that understanding. I'm really, you know, kind of proud of the California Alliance for Golf. I, I think it definitely has acted in an exemplary fashion in recent years in that regard. Uh, the one organization that doesn't participate with us has been less than exemplary. And that's also something the California Alliance for Golf, and you're on that, you're an officer of that, Len, that you'll deal with next week. I hope I answered your question. You did, Craig, you did, thank you. You know what, we're, we're in, uh, as we said many times, you know, uh, 40 million people in our state, the fifth largest economy, there's always something going on here in California, and there's generally always something uh, big going on here in California. So, uh, Craig, again, thank you, uh, you and Kevin, for keeping us uh, up to speed all all these seven months now uh, that we've been doing the chats through COVID, even though it probably feels like seven years or longer because of the emotional swings and such. So, thank you, uh, Craig, for all that you've done for us and continue to do. And um, uh, time to start wrapping up. Uh, everybody, it's just about the stroke of 11 here on Friday the 6th. So I'd like to start with our Northern California uh, PGA president, uh, Didi Moriarty. Didi? No, thank you, Lynn. Uh, thanks, everybody, for the opportunity just to call in and hope everybody's doing okay and is uh, really going through this uh, time that we're going through. I'm here at the beautiful Presidio Golf Course doing a few lessons, but um, I definitely just wanted to check in and say hello and uh, and go from there. But um, thank you very much, Len. Thanks for the opportunity to say hi to everybody. All right, thanks, Didi. Glad you're able to, to jump in and having a wonderful day at, at Presidio in San Francisco. Um, Tom? Or, yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. And, and uh, thanks to Craig and Jim and very, very informative uh, hour. Uh, and we appreciate it and appreciate the time for both of them and Craig's continuing uh, support of this program. So, uh, Tony Latendre, final words? Well, in the interest of everybody's time, how about I just say ditto? And thanks, thanks again for everybody, and thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks, Tony. Thanks again to Nikki and Bryce and Caitlin and Tyler and you and everyone, and uh, uh, appreciate it. Uh, good to good to see the names. We can see the names of the attendees. It's great, and appreciate you being here uh, and listening in. Len, yeah, thanks, Tom. So uh, again, to everyone, so many roles we play in the industry. Thank you all for being who you are and what you're doing as we continue to move. The you know the and the best to President Richardson uh, and the team, Vice President Lindert and Secretary Don Ray. Certainly more to come. Uh, just a, one one bit of housekeeping. We've got two more. Two more California Nevada chats left for the year, two weeks on November 20, and then December 4. So December 4 will be our wrap uh, for 2020. And uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, good luck, uh, best to everyone. Be safe, please, as we head into the weekend. Uh, happy Veterans Day uh, uh, next week, and uh, enjoy the weekend. Be safe, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.